I wanna show you something that to me is quite bizarre. It's a tweet sent by the mayor of Miami, Florida, Francis Suarez, saying that he wants to take his next paycheck 100% in Bitcoin. But wait, scroll down and look at the replies and there's this guy, Eric Adams, saying that he wants to take his next three paychecks in Bitcoin. Oh, and by the way, if you don't recognize this guy, it's because he was just elected as the mayor of New York City. The mayor of the people. These are major politicians here and they are very publicly promoting cryptocurrencies. I feel like I can't go 10 minutes on the internet without running into some Bitcoin this, Ethereum that, or hearing about some young dude becoming really rich from some dog related meme money. I'm sure you've noticed this too if you spend any time on the internet. Maybe you've been avoiding it kind of like I have because I don't know, the vibes are just kind of off. Thank you, Michael. Well, now, the Doge father. That's weird. It's really weird. But there's no avoiding this. 2021 is the year that crypto went full-blown mainstream. Since then, we've seen the price of Bitcoin double. So as of right now, I've made an extra $200. El Salvador became the first country in the world on Tuesday to make Bitcoin legal tender. The, Bitcoin. the whole thing is a joke. Even the Flintstones knew better than crypto. Oh, come on, are you making any sense of this? Dogecoin is the people's crypto. Just became a Dogecoin millionaire. The big story this morning, Staples Center getting a name change. Yeah, it is soon going to be known as Crypto.com Arena. spike in cryptocurrency scams. Non-fungible tokens. They're taking over the art world. Your work sold for $69 million. So, oh, so it's a hustle. This movement started as a small ideological project before eventually attracting hordes of scams and gamblers. And now it's been embraced by Wall Street and Silicon Valley. The question we all need to be asking is not how does the blockchain work and what's the technology that underpins all this? What you need to be asking is, is this takeover a good thing? Because that's a really complicated question. Hold on. Yes, it is a great thing. Okay. Actually, this is not good. This is very bad. It's bad? Wait, hold on a second. I don't do these types of videos where I do like this sort of like debate myself thing. That's not what I do. Why are we doing this? Well, you do now. <laughs> Okay, I'll let you two work this out and debate the pros and cons of crypto, but I just wanna say one last thing here, which is that this space is really hard to navigate for anyone looking for good information. Most of the commentary around crypto comes from people who have a direct financial stake in getting more people to buy their coin of choice. There's a lot of motivated reasoning that can happen when your money is on the line. So with that, I'm just gonna sit back and enjoy the show. Okay, wait, pa everyone pause just for a second because I need to thank today's sponsor because that's literally my job and that's how I pay my bills. So I'm going to do that now and then we can get back to it. The sponsor of today's video is BetterHelp. Here's the fact of the matter. Finding a therapist is really hard. I went through the process for several years trying to find a good therapist by calling doctor's offices and sitting in waiting rooms and trying to see if they've lined up with my insurance. BetterHelp is a platform that attempts to make this a much easier, smoother process. What you do is you go on, you fill out your information and they match you with a licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with somebody within 48 hours. It is not a crisis line or a self-help thing. It is professional therapy that is done on the internet. There's a broad range of expertises. There's a huge network of therapists so that you can choose from people who might not be available to you in your city, but are on this network and are just in a different place. And they make it easy to change therapists if needed. It takes a moment to find a good therapist sometimes and they make it easy to change. All of this is to say that I'm a major fan of therapy generally. I think that therapy is way too stigmatized and not accessible enough in our society, and it should be. It has changed my life, and I think that everyone should try to get therapy. BetterHelp is a platform that is trying to make it more affordable than the traditional slog of going and trying to find a therapist. So if you want to try this out, you can get 10% off your first month. If you go to the link in my description, it's betterhelp.com slash Johnny Harris. 
You get 10% off, you can try it out, see if it works for you. Thank you BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to our debate. Go ahead guys. Okay, let's start out with the most obvious just waste here, which is all of the wasted energy. Look at this chart. This chart is the amount of electricity it takes to run the Bitcoin network. Just Bitcoin, not any other cryptocurrency. Right now, it's almost on par with the electricity consumption of Argentina, a whole country. Why does it take so much energy to create internet money? Well, let's also be Great honest. question. It's because the security of Bitcoin and Ethereum depend on thousands of computers racing to randomly guess a 64 digit number first, day and night forever. And when the price of like Bitcoin goes up, more computers jump on board, which is more electricity, which is more climate change. And they work so hard that they wear themselves out and just die after a few years, becoming a pile of useless e-waste. Tons of energy, tons of waste. Why are we doing this? Okay, hold on, hold on. You've been talking for long enough. Let me chime in here. Yes, these computers use a lot of electricity, but not all of that electricity is produced by burning fossil fuels. You'll notice that more and more our electricity is clean. It comes from like solar panels and wind turbines. There's even this recent survey where they went around and asked, where do you get your electricity from? And for the crypto miners that responded, 40% of their energy comes from renewables. Crypto mining is also well suited for grabbing energy that might otherwise be wasted. There's this one oil facility in Utah where they have to burn a bunch of natural gas because it's like a byproduct from their oil extraction. So instead of just burning this into the atmosphere, they put a crypto mine in a shipping container to use that natural gas as electricity to run their computers. Stuff like this is brilliant and it's happening all over the place. There's also wind energy from these big wind turbines. Oftentimes the wind is blowing and making electricity at times when humans don't really need it, like in the middle of the night. So these crypto computers that are mining cryptocurrency never need to sleep and so they can ramp up in the night and use this electricity that would have otherwise just gone to waste. And besides, why are we singling out crypto for using energy? Everything uses energy. The question is whether or not the product merits that use, which it does. And let me explain why. Wait, no, 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 no. You're not gonna explain why because that's the whole point. You just said it. You're talking about internet money that's built off of electricity and fancy math. I hate math. The product is useless. It's actually worse than useless. It's actually harmful. Every week, some new crypto company gets hacked or runs some scam or claims that their scam was a hack. There's no consumer protection. It's the wild west and there's a lot of predatory behavior. The most recent example is this squid game cryptocurrency. Investors crying scam over a cryptocurrency inspired by the hit Netflix show Squid Game. Someone decided to make a cryptocurrency called Squid. They posted this beautiful paper outlining that it was like a play to earn online game. It was gonna be released next month. They got all the hype going. The price shot up like this. And as soon as it got right here, the creator cashed out and disappeared with over $3 million. Oh, ow, it went to zero. This happens all the time. Well, why are people buying it? People should, wouldn't be buying it if it wasn't onto something. People are willing to buy whatever if there's enough hype. Why are you buying it? Because it's supreme. And because of guys like this, a 33-year-old California dude who put his entire savings into Dogecoin. And now he says he's a millionaire. Everyone wants to be this guy. They want to be the next version of this dude. This is classic casino psychology. The winners are nice and loud, telling everyone how lucky they were, and the losers quietly retreat into their shame. It all creates this false impression that everyone is getting hilariously rich and you're not, which happens to literally be the name of this New York Times headline, which is not very helpful for quelling the FOMO among people who might invest their precious money into fake internet money. The fact is, there's nothing backing this. This is all human psychology, which I get it. A lot of financial systems are human psychology. But when you invest in a home or a business stock, you're betting on something that has a track record of being useful to people. With crypto, you're investing in a belief that a bigger group of followers is coming behind you and that each of those people will be betting on the same belief. It's not even a scheme per se, it's
I have to go make a call. Those guys at the top need us to buy or they lose. You may have noticed that recently on your PayPal app or your cash app, you can now buy crypto. Well, it turns out that the CEOs of those companies, these guys, are both personally invested in Bitcoin. They're up here at the top of the pyramid. And so of course they're gonna make it easy for you to buy in too because they get rich if you buy in. <laughs> but the upshot is yes, it is possible to make money with this. It's always been possible to get rich with rising bubbles that transfer wealth from the late adopters to the early ones. That doesn't mean it's a good investment and it also definitely doesn't mean it's good for the world. Dude, you're totally missing the point, okay? Yes, it is true and you're right that in these early days, there's a lot of nonsense and scams and garbage happening. But that's what happens when there's innovation. People jump in and try things out. They make mistakes, people get scammed, but eventually the technology matures. That's where we're headed here. Don't look at the random dude who's getting rich. Instead, you need to look back at the first year of Bitcoin, back in January 2008. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. This could be the most serious recession in decades. The economy was in a free fall. Banks and regulators had massively mismanaged our financial system. Governments were bailing out these banks because they were, quote, too big to fail. And out of nowhere, someone writing under a pen name, Satoshi Nakamoto, proposed this idea of Bitcoin, which was a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, something that wouldn't need governments or banks. The first block of code to start off this decentralized record that every Bitcoin transaction would be built upon. In that first code, you see a little Easter egg, a headline from the day's news of governments bailing out banks. Nakamoto wrote that, quote, the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that is required to make it work. Bitcoin would solve this using the same ethic that had built the internet. Connecting strangers from around the world without the need of a middleman. So yes, this is useful because detaching money from these big institutions that have screwed it up is useful for a lot of things. Oh yeah, totally. You mean like uh, buying drugs? Well, yes, but also a bunch of other things that you probably can't imagine because you live here in the United States. Consider Nigeria for a second. Last year, the government literally froze the bank accounts of 20 people who were protesting police brutality in the country. But some of them were able to still receive donations through Bitcoin because the government couldn't freeze that. Look at another example, Venezuela, a place where a stack of money is worth nothing because of hyperinflation. Purse is made entirely of the bills of the Venezuelan currency, the bolivares. Inflation is so high that this money is now completely worthless. This wiped out people's life savings, all because of trust in these big institutions. These are problems that don't happen with Bitcoin. There's no government that can freeze your account. There's no government that can print more money and devalue your coins. It's not controlled by governments or a team of executives. It's controlled by the community. The fact of the matter is, all money is turning digital. And let me guess, you probably trust your central bank and your government because you live here in the US. But according to the Human Rights Foundation, more than half the world's population lives under an authoritarian regime. I get it, I get it. Removing banks and governments as the middleman has some major upside. But who's gonna protect the Nigerians and Venezuelans from Bitcoin scammers and hackers? I mean, just look at this list. This is a list of all of the cryptocurrency exchanges that have been hacked. It's a really long list. Imagine if you're just a normal consumer who isn't like a tech person. Like, if you don't have at least some institutional buffer, you're way more vulnerable. But the blockchain, it's so secure, it's public record, it's verified through all this fancy technology. Yeah, the blockchain is. The blockchain is a fantastic, really cool thing. But people aren't interacting with the blockchain directly. You still need all of these services to buy and sell your crypto. It's these third-party companies that turn into another middleman, vulnerable of being hacked. And they are all the time. 
but let's just say that your crypto assets are totally safe, they never get hacked. You're still subject to insane levels of volatility. I mean, look at Bitcoin's graph, it's swinging all of the time. It swings by 30% or more. Which is great if you're like a risk tolerant guy with a ton of money to play with on the internet, this is a really fun thing to do. But what if you're somebody who actually needs your currency to stay stable so that you can know its value, so that you can go buy, I don't know, groceries? So how do you control these hyper volatile assets so that they stay predictable? Well, maybe some sort of authority middleman and now we're right back into the messy world of trust and middlemen government control. This is happening right now in El Salvador. El Salvador became the first country in the world on Tuesday to make Bitcoin legal tender. What does this mean for Bitcoin? What does this mean for El Salvador? Earlier this year, the president of El Salvador announced that Bitcoin would become like an official currency, like a legal form of money, and that every business in the country would have to accept it. It will run as another option alongside the current currency, US dollar. But guess what? All of the infrastructure to actually use Bitcoin to buy things, the app where you can actually exchange and buy Bitcoin, the ATMs to withdraw the cash, it's controlled by the national government. It's like crypto is fantastic in theory and for a select few people who have disposable income to play around with, but it rarely happens in practice without the same old dynamics of a middleman coming in to make sure it works for the masses. Oh gosh, you're focusing so much on how it works now. I mean, if you were to apply that logic, like go back to the internet 1.0. Everything you need for a great internet experience. Wake up and smell the 90s. You have an internet browser in the 1990s. We have the birth of a website. It is a thing that you log onto the internet, you read things, you click links, and that's it. It is a read-only experience. People could have thought like, oh, that's the internet. Like, this is what we do. We go read things. This is boring. It's just a digital encyclopedia that's connected to other people's computers. I don't need a history lesson. Where are you going with this? Just hear me out for a second. Yeah, hear him out. Come on. Wait a minute. You're still here? Yeah, I'm still here. I've been here the whole time. Trying to make up my mind as you two argue. Go ahead. Okay, okay, so that was the internet in the 90s. But then we got Web 2. In the 2000s, you start to see web pages go from static to dynamic. Users can now generate their own content, from blogs to uploading to MySpace and then Facebook and YouTube. They're now participating in the internet. They're upvoting comments. That's where we are now. We're in a part of the internet where you're actually participating. We are creating the internet together. But in doing so, we created these centralized digital kingdoms owned by giant tech companies who, in exchange for us being able to participate in this cool new internet, they take our data, they show us ads, and they make billions and billions and billions of dollars. Sometimes they share a little bit of those billions of dollars with the creators, but most of us are doing free work for these big tech companies so that we can participate and make content for their interactive web pages. There's a better way, Web3. This is what we're moving into. It'll allow us to move money, make purchases, connect with people without the permission of Mark Zuckerberg or JP Morgan or the government of the United States. They're not a part of this equation at all. It is a vision for an entirely new type of internet. Do you hear yourself? You sound like some like authoritarian politician peddling some utopian vision for the future. Let's get back to facts. Wait, no, this is actually happening. This isn't some nebulous vision for the future. We get it, Bitcoin was a currency that is inherently limited. But Ethereum is a new technology that uses the same concept of getting rid of middlemen, but instead of just allowing us to do the currency thing, it allows you to do tons of things that we used to need institutions for. It's something called a token. Oh gosh, here we go again with tokens. Tokens, tokens, tokens. Tokens, let me guess, are going to save the world. They're going to change everything. Everything is solved by tokens on the blockchain. All I see tokens being used for is selling digital art for millions of dollars to speculators who want attention on the internet. Yes, making digital things scarce on the internet is one of the first major applications for this. But this is just the beginning. You gotta think ahead, man. Think about it. Borrowing money, signing contracts, investing. 
There's so many things that we do where there are huge middlemen in the center who are making tons of money off of ensuring that the transaction goes properly. I'll take that back. I mean, just imagine an internet that is owned and governed by the users. Instead of logging on to each of these platforms with your separate username and giving over all of your data, you log on to one unique wallet that holds all of your personal information, all of your crypto assets that are protected by this very sophisticated cryptography. Your data isn't owned and stored by these giant tech companies, but instead it is stored on encrypted ledgers and you get to decide who you share it with and how to value it. I'm telling you, I know it's really early, and all you're seeing is like millions of dollar cat gifts. But what this is doing is fueling a creative boom among really bright developers, which in 10 years from now will have totally transformed the internet. I hear you painting this picture of some internet utopia where everyone has a voice. I would love a world where users actually have ownership over what happens online and they can share decision-making and revenue. And while we're talking about blockchain, this cure-all technology that people just throw around like it's gonna save everything, let us remember that in reality, blockchain is secured with cryptography, which is actually very inefficient by design. If you really want decentralization, you need to have a network that is redundant and slow and hard to navigate without a third party being your middleman. You, the user, have to trust in these companies to run things smoothly. So why do you need a blockchain anymore? When now you're trusting a third party company to do all this work for you. I think it's a much more narrow tool than you think. And a lot of people are gonna lose a lot of money before they realize that that's the case. <sighs> Okay, let's all take a deep breath. That was a lot. And as impassioned as this got, I promise you it's a hundred times more intense in Twitter feeds around the internet. People feel very strongly on both sides of this. You'll probably be seeing it in the comments here pretty soon. I wanna know which of these people you agree with. Do you agree with the optimistic view of crypto? Or do you think that this is just another obscure technology that will have its day and be a bubble that eventually bursts. For me, I'm still learning. I'm gonna drink in as much information on this topic as it develops because we're still in the early stages. And I actually don't think it's healthy that we have to make our minds up on topics that are still really, really theoretical. To me, it's a much better idea to sit back and take in the information as it comes. And eventually you'll start to develop your own opinion. You should be compelled to do so by the evidence, by the data that speaks to you, not by angry bullies in Twitter feeds. So keep your mind open, but not so open that your brain falls out. Be careful out there. Don't forget to uh, buy Dogecoin and buy um, Ethereum. Uh.